Hey, we've been uh, we've been excited to do this uh, to to preach together or to teach together and to encourage the body as we've been looking at Matthew chapter five. We've been uh, encouraged that uh, Jesus challenges us on a regular basis. Anybody else encouraged by Jesus' challenges? I mean, it's like, yes, I want to be like you, Jesus. And I hope that's always your response, that you say, yes, I want to be more and more like Jesus. And so uh, today, we're going to continue to talk about marriage, about relationship. And so we said at the beginning of the series that there'll be a day that Rachel and I uh, get to share with you our story, what God has done in our life and to bring restoration and to bring hope. Uh, as I was thinking about uh, a whole marriage, you know, in the, in, the, in the church we can look to Scripture and say, yeah, we know that a marriage looked like Jesus' relationship with the church, right? He gave everything. He poured it all out, even to the point of death, and, and served and, and uplifted and washed us clean and made us whole. And um, when, I, when we first got married... You know, that was like, that was definitely the beautiful picture that we had. We said, oh yeah, we want to see that happen. But the reality was we, we weren't walking and experiencing that at, at all. Uh, and so I thought, as I looked at the, at the church and as we encouraged the church, we said, you know what, there's other people in the church too that are not experiencing uh, everything that God would want a, a marriage to look like. And so we said, hey, we've got to bring some hope because uh, in, our, in our walk, with Jesus, we met. We met. You guys don't maybe not know all the story, but we met in Bible college. We said, "Hey, we're we're going to college so that we could study to be in the ministry." So you know, we had like we knew Jesus, we loved Jesus, we wanted to do ministry stuff. Um, but I just always confirm this that we're still human people, right? We're still people. I get the role of the pastor. I get to speak on Sunday morning. Rachel gets to help with the kids, but we're still just people, and so we had problems. And it went, it went on a search for us, uh, to search to try to figure out what was going on. Like, we, I went to counselors, we went to pastors, we went to friends. We said, hey, things aren't looking like what we see Jesus and the church looking like. Jesus and the church looks like nice and beauty and peace and, and love and submitting to one another and caring for one another. And I said, it, it looks like World War III in our house like, on a regular basis. <laughs> I said, I said... I want some help. And, and so uh, really well-meaning ministers and really well-meaning friends would always say simple things like, all right, I'll pray for you. And, you know, and after I heard that for a while, I was like, that's good, but I still have to, we still have to go home and, and be with each other. Like, like where, what's going, what's going to help me out with, you know, when chaos is happening in the house? I don't even know. You don't even know. We look so nice. We look so pretty. I mean, you know, like, you know, don't care. But I'm telling you, like World War III, the yelling, screaming, breaking things. Uh, when, when, when advice was not the greatest advice was, well, why don't you just divorce her? Why don't you? Why don't you? Yes. Like, this is stuff. I'm, I'm not. I'm, uh, this is real. Bible college. So we're Bible college. People are like, why don't you just leave? Like, what? If, that's an option. I said this. Not an option. So we were convinced. Last week's scripture, last two weeks' scripture, we, we said Jesus uh, Jesus was convinced that, uh, we were convinced that Jesus and God were not approving of divorce, of separation, of breaking up relationship. Why is that? Last week we mentioned that. Why? Because God is a God of relationship. He's a God of love. And he wants restoration and wholeness. He's always for serving one another. And I said, I can't do that. So I got that in the back of my mind. I said, that's the... That's the one option. I said, no, that's the only thing, that's the only thing that held us together. We said, we know Jesus hates divorce, so we're going to figure this out. And we, uh, and you guys know our ministry story. This is, this is the behind the scenes of our ministry story. So yeah, we planted a church. Yeah, we started Kyle for missionaries. We went to Florida State University. We were there. We told them the same problems. They saw our problems on a regular basis. They're like, uh, they told Rachel, why don't you just stop the baby? Why don't you, why don't you just stop? Why don't you just get over it? Get over your problem. Over it. Like, why, why are you so sad? Get over it. And we said, no, that's not the answer. That, that, that's not the answer. The fighting and, was still continuing. The arguments were still continuing. The shutdowns, communication skills still continue to be not great. So yeah, so today we wanted to give hope for those in relationships, those who have been in a relationship, those who are going into a relationship, that there is hope for wholeness and 
for love to exist. And we today are a testimony that there's hope in the gospel. There's hope for relationships. There's hope for the two becoming one, that it can really be a thing that looks beautiful and represents the gospel. And so Rachel's going to share a little bit. Um, but that's our, that's our goal today. Can we pray? Can I pray that way before we continue sharing that hope arises? God, I just thank you for your church. I, I thank you for what you have done in our lives to bring us to a place where love can exist and a relationship can happen. Father, I pray now that you would bless your people to have ears to hear today and to receive hope. Father, I pray that most of all, God, that there is hope in the gospel for restoration. And I pray that that would arise no matter what uh, we may find ourselves in, no matter what muck may exist. God, I pray that hope would arise. And Father, we would receive from you in Jesus' name. So just a little tidbit about Rachel. Um, at the age of 17, I was diagnosed with abnormal blood vessels in my intestines, and it would cause me to have internal bleeding. Oh, that was hard in itself. <laughs> um, I've been praying for healing and belief that you know, God was a healer, God was going to heal me, I got this. I knew I wanted to be in ministry overseas and be a missionary, and um, and it just wasn't, wasn't happening. So when Andrew and I got together, I had another episode. I passed my three-year mark. I was like, yes, God healed me. I'm awesome. I passed the mark. No, it didn't, didn't happen. Um, I had another bleed, and I was hospitalized. And Andrew was there from the beginning of that season and I went into depression and started believing the lies about Jesus. The truth that I knew was God loves me, God's a healer, but I wasn't believing it. I believed that God didn't care about me. I believed that I wasn't worth, worth it. I started believing the truth that I had was diminishing. And became into depression, and then um, just felt that you know I wasn't important, and that he didn't care about me. He could heal everybody else, but he didn't want to heal me, and I didn't fully understand what was really going on. So then Andrew and I got married, and felt like everything was falling apart. We found out that there was a zero percent chance of us getting pregnant, and the little value and worth that I had. Was gone. And those lies that I was mentioning earlier got deeper into my soul. And now I'm, I'm battling depression and anxiety. But then it's like, well, there's no point of us getting, having a child because I'm not going to be a good mom. That's why I can't get pregnant, right? Um, and so this caused me to get more deep in depression, like I said, and high anxiety. And I couldn't do anything right. There was one night that I, I cooked a meal. I was so proud of it. I don't remember what it was. But I was like, awesome, I cooked a meal and it tastes delicious. What did Andrew do? He put salt in it. That, <laughs> that's the worst, right? <laughs> no, seriously, it, it really hurt me. I felt that my response to him was, was my food not good enough for you? That you had to put salt in it? Did it not taste good? Am I not good enough for you? So then those lies are now coming into our relationship of how Andrew is feeling me. And he would say, oh, baby, no, it tastes really good. I just need a little bit more salt. I'm like, well, then you must not love me if you had to add salt. And this is just one example of many examples of what was going on at home. And he would always try to encourage me, no, it is a good job. And I always say, you have to say that. You're my husband. <laughs> and I began to realize that I was seeking to him for my approval, for my self-worth, that I had value, that I was loved, and that my satisfaction came into him. And when he couldn't do it, I felt like our life, my life was completely out of control, that I was trying to take control. This is, 
this is something we, we found ourselves regularly um, at the beginning of our uh, marriage, I would say the first six years. So this constant uh, lies that would creep into our hearts, Rachel confessing, hey, yeah, I was believing that, that God didn't love me, I had no value, and then everything that I would do as a husband, uh, of course, you want to be the one that, that makes your wife happy. You want to meet her needs. You want to try to, to bring value to her life and, and to uplift her. And so I would constantly try to do the, the same thing. I was, hey, let me try to give her give her a bunch of compliments. Let me try to serve her. I would, you know, clean the house the way I thought was was the best thing, so that she'd come home and, and be so happy. And you know, I'd try to make her make her feel good. And then and then she would then it would plague into her life. So then, uh, you know, she felt she didn't have any value. She was she had this expectation, uh, unhealthy expectation. As a woman, she needs to be the one that cleans the house and cooks the house and or cooks in the house and, and does all these things. And then here I am trying to serve her and, and make her happy. So I'm going to try to do more uh, things to her. And, and so it, it went for me to a place of exhaustion. Yeah, I'm trying to do all these things. And everything that I tried to do, I, I couldn't make her. I couldn't make her happy. I, I couldn't satisfy her. Um, and this then begin my spiral into what I, I believed about myself. Now, I, I'll just confess as, as a man, I, man, I wanted to accomplish things. I wanted to make things happy. I wanted to make things right. I wanted to fix problems. Uh, and then I found that I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't fix her happiness. I couldn't, I couldn't fix her value. If I, if I said I love you to her, she was like, the common line, we, we snickered about it. The common line was, oh, you just have to say that. You're my husband. You just have to say my I look good. You just have to say I, I love you. You just have to say my, my you do look good. <laughs> uh, without a doubt, without a doubt. And, and so then in my life, so then so then for me, man, I believe, man, I can't even make my wife happy. I have all these other, you know, at that time being a minister, I had a public life, right? That you know everybody said, oh yeah, Pastor, you're preaching well, or hey, you're you're doing this well, and so I had this this. One side of me received the compliment that at home I felt like hey, a complete failure. I couldn't do anything right, um, and so this this caused me to go into depression, have suicidal thoughts. I remember the day I was driving down the road on 44 uh, in southern Missouri, and it started to rain, and the thought of missing the turn, the crash, um, just so I could escape from the reality of our chaos. Well, and those lies just begin to become deeper and deeper to the point. Um, yeah, we had uh, we have gone we've gone to counseling. We're going to get to the happy part. Uh, <laughs> yes. We're going to get to the happy part. But but at that at that point, I mean, having having murderous uh, thoughts and just what ways can I do to to get out of this so that we can have uh, so for me so I could be satisfied so I could continue to go and, and to uh, to live a life that brought peace to me, brought happiness to me, and, and it became, I became self-focused. How could I get out so that I could fulfill what I thought God had for me? And I, 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 just saying that, I know how warped that sounds. But this is how the lies, when we begin to believe lies about who God is and what our purpose was and what he created us to be, all of a sudden, chaos and, and ungodly things began to come into our mind. And it wasn't until, so we, we went through uh, six years, uh, we got to six years of marriage, and, and many, many of the people in the church that have been here for a while know that we spent time at Purdue University uh, with us uh, as a missionary, as a missionary. And so, uh, again, this is behind the scenes. So on the, on the front side, what everybody got to see publicly was those really awesome uh, newsletters we would send. You know, we say, hey, we've got another, per another person came to Jesus. Hey, look at this baptism. Hey, look at the, all these ministry opportunities. Uh, behind the scenes, I mean, we, we didn't sleep in the same bed sometimes. We were arguing. We were fighting. We were chaotic. And we sat across from somebody for the first time in our whole, in our whole life. We sat across from somebody that believed that, that God could do something about what we were going through. Uh, and you guys, I'm praying that uh, we get to invite Linda at some point to come and, and, and minister here at the church. But we sat across from somebody that for the first time had battled in their faith and believed that there was hope for our marriage. She said, hey, I've gone through up uh, before. She, she lived her life uh, as a transgender, uh, she, she was a woman, a transgender male, and wanted to, be, uh, wanted to transition. And then God broke into her life and brought hope and healing into her life. And she sat across from us and said, I don't know if I have all the answers, 
But this is one thing that I know. And she read to us Romans chapter 1, verse 16. One thing that I know for sure. She said that she is, in Romans 1, 16, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is salvation for all those who believe. And remember sitting across from somebody for the first time, they didn't just offer to pray, which was good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to offer to pray for you because, hey, we believe that God is a God of the impossible and that he can, he, and he, can bring, uh, he can bring hope and restoration into any situation. I believe in the power of prayer. But the first time somebody stood across from me and said, you know what, it's not just, it's, I'm not just going to pray for you, I'm going to walk with you. I, I know that the gospel, there is hope, there is salvation, and if you're not experiencing salvation, salvation in, this, in that context, or in, throughout all of scripture, it means wholeness, restoration, your whole being being restored to God. And so she looked across and said, you know what, there's hope for you guys. I don't know all the answers, but we're going to walk through it, and we're going to get to the depths of who you are and begin to transform all those lies that you believe into the truth of what God speaks over your life, and you're going to experience freedom. And so this was a journey for us. And, and I wanted to say this. It's been a popular thing recently. There was another um, major minister across the nation uh, that committed suicide. And uh, there was a popular thing that went, uh, saying that started going around social media that said this, that it's okay to have Jesus and a counselor. I want to encourage you guys, it's okay to get help that you need. Jesus is with you, and Jesus will guide you. His Spirit will lead you through those things into truth, and I believe that's the role of the Holy Spirit. But as you come to Rachel and I, and we, we're hoping that this begins a journey of healing for our church, but that, hey, it's okay to have Jesus and a professional that's going to help navigate the things that are inside your hearts and inside your minds. So I remember um, at kind of, kind of a pinnacle point in our, in our walk towards healing was on a Sunday morning um, at, at Connection Point Church. And, and you guys, I, I, we started our story by saying, hey, we were Bible college student, students, and so we, we've read through the Bible, we've, we've memorized scripture, we, uh, you know, even at that point, hey, I could preach a good sermon and people, people will respond to Jesus. Um, but uh, there was this moment in the middle of service, and Rachel uh, was dealing with a lot of anxiety. Do you want to describe that at all? Yeah, so the anxiety that I was having is that there is a person in front of me, person beside me, on my left, person to my right, people behind me, and I was feeling claustrophobic. She's to the point of, like, I was literally, like, having a panic attack, even though they're, like, I'm standing, like, right here, and there's, like, a chair in between us, um, and, and that on the other side, and that behind, so they're not, like, strictly, like, this close to me, but that's how it felt, and I am not a, I love hugs, but I'm not a touchy-touchy person, <laughs> so then it's, like, having someone this close, I'm, like, you've got to move. And then they're like, why? Don't you like this? I'm like, I love you, but you've got to move, please. And I would get to a point of where I, I panic, to where like, I'm just like, my hands are shaking, my insides are shaking, and I just want to scream, and I'm just like, I look to Angie, and I'm like, I just gotta go, I gotta get out of here, I gotta get out of here, I can't breathe. <laughs> yeah, and this was like a constant thing, every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. And uh, she would tell me, oh, i got to leave. And I was, uh, you know, like, raised in the church, uh, a pastor, a missionary. I had a lot of fear of what people would think about us. My wife leaving church and going home and spending time alone. And, and then I also had these other, uh, you know, maybe the religious rules I had in my head. And I said, no, you have to stay in church. This is the best place for you. You're going to have worship. We're going to have the word. We're going to have prayer. It's all right here. You need to be here with me right now. And so I tell her no. Over and over again, I tell her no. Then there was one particular Sunday when she could again, man, anxiety, panic attack. I could see it on her face. I knew what was going on. And she asked me again, Andrew, can I go home? And I paused for a second because I heard the Holy Spirit's voice. And the Holy Spirit asked me, he says, Andrew, do you trust me? 
you, and how many of you have a conversation with God? Sometimes it lasts just a moment, but it's a whole conversation. So the Holy Spirit says, Andrew, do you trust me? And in my mind, I said, of course I do. Right? And he says, go ahead and let Rachel go home. I said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, I, I didn't know it. I mean, like, this is where, she, you know, and I, I just repeated the same reasoning I just gave you guys. Man, this is where the presence of God is. This is where the worship is. This is where the word is. This is where the prayer is. She's the people of God. This is what, it's Sunday morning. We're supposed to be here. And the Holy Spirit said, go ahead and let her go. I said, I said, no, God. There's, I know she's going to go home, and, you know, in the middle of depression, it was real. I mean, she would go home, and there would be, you know, she would sit on the couch all day, and, 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 and she wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, and I said, I cannot do that. The Holy Spirit said, Andrew, do you trust me? And at that moment, for up to this, this level, so this has been six years of this, I, I have been trying because of, the fear of what people thought about us and what people would think about us. I've been trying to control and trying to manipulate and make sure we stayed this status quo for everybody to see. And I have, and yeah, I have controlled the situation to the point, man, I even took control from the Holy Spirit. I tried to, to gain control, but I said, hey, and he says, do you trust me? And so at that moment, I took a breath and I turned to Rachel, I said, go ahead, Rachel. You can go home. Here's the keys. I'll get a ride home. We'll figure it out. I just want to tell you that the Holy Spirit can speak through anything. It doesn't matter if you're in church or you're in a car listening to music. God can speak to you. You just have to open your ears to hear it. And so when Andrew um, allowed me <laughs> to, to go home, but, I mean, that, that was my fear as well. So if I... I wanted to seek his approval, so I had to ask his permission. Um, that shouldn't have been his place to begin with. But, so I went home, I got into some comfy clothes, and I really felt that I was supposed to watch Beauty and the Beast. I love Beauty and the Beast. But to this day, I can't watch it the same way that I did before this time. So I was watching Beauty and the Beast, and this scene of, um, it's like towards the end, when the townspeople are wanting to go kill the beast because he's evil, he's mean, he's out of control, he wants to destroy everything, he doesn't care about anybody. Well, as I was watching this scene, I kid you not, the Holy Spirit looked at me and said, Rachel, dear, this is how you're viewing me. And this is not who I am, that this is what you're believing about me. So why don't, and then it like, it was like, just like Andrew said, like a split second that you're having a conversation, I'm like, oh, man, Jesus, you're right. I am not believing in you the way that I know in my heart. And then the scene of Bell, where Bell is defending the beast. And it's like, no, don't kill him. He's loving. Because she got to know his character. And so at that time, Jesus was inviting me to start looking at his character. And view him the way that Bell was viewing the beast and not how the townspeople were viewing him. So then that day... I, I was viewing him out of control, unloving, unapproachable. And then when I saw how Belle saw the beast, it was crazy, guys. I started looking at him as he's good. He is caring. He is loving. He's always there. He never left me when I was 17 years old. Just because I can't go live overseas doesn't mean I still can't do ministry. I can go visit, and I can travel. I just have to get it pre-approved. But just because I wasn't able to do what I thought the Lord wanted me to do doesn't mean that my value is any different than what the Lord already had for me. It just may look different. So Jesus was asking me to be able to trust him during this time as well, with all this ick going on. So... 
I began to see that he saw value in me. He chose me. And I am literally having a spiritual breakdown. I am crying, snotting everywhere. I hate crying in front of people. And so Andrew comes home and I quickly want to hide. But Andrew looked at me and was like, what's, what's going on? He like very concerning of like, why am I coming home and my wife is like, is a rock right now. I was, I was a wreck. And I began to tell him what the Lord was speaking to me through this movie of how I was viewing the, the beast, the way the townspeople were, and how I needed to view the way that Bell was viewing him, and that how he invited me into his true character, and how he wants me to see him, and how my perception and views and lies that I believed for so long needed to change. And so I started replacing the lies with the truth with Andrew's help. We did a, an awesome exercise called Fruit to Root, and that began, that began to be our journey. Everything shifted. Uh, I don't know how to describe it exactly, but everything yeah. shifted that day when all of a sudden Actually, we chose to believe the truth of who God is. Um, I mentioned earlier, hey, I, I could preach a sermon that no matter where you are in all the world, that uh, you know, you're never too far away from God, right? And I could, I could encourage people from that. But then I, I found out in my heart that I never truly believed that. I didn't believe that Rachel could be at home on a couch watching Beauty and the Beast <laughs> and receive a word from God. But yet I could, I could, I know that's true by Scripture. I, I know that hey, God can reveal in, in all of creation. God reveals His truth of who He is, right? And so we begin to, to walk through this. And in John chapter 8, verse 31 through 32, this is going to be a key uh, verse in, in our transformation. It says this, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So as... Yeah, go for it. Sorry. Go for it. Um. I just want to say we've been talking about these lies. There are still lies that I have to combat with every day, but knowing that Jesus is with me and that I can take those lies and turn them into what the Lord says, what Jesus says about who I am and my identity is in him. That, yeah, so like once I start replacing those lies with the truth, I'm able to stand here. And when we were singing that song, Victory, I'm like, why, why is everyone not jumping and shouting right now? Because we have victory in Jesus. I almost wanted to come up and say something about it. Do it next time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have victory. And I can walk in victory because of where I've been and where I'm going to be. But because of Jesus and what he did on the cross for me, saved my soul, can speak to me through beauty and the beast, I can stand here, maybe not whole to the point of where I'm able to go be with him, but whole enough to where we can minister, and whole enough to where I can be in victory. Even those those lies, those lies are always going to come, guys. We're always going to combat those lies, but it's what we do with them that's the key. Yeah, so we can even. We can, we can even speak to the, the value of uh, the, the lie that she wasn't, that Rachel wasn't worth anything. So she, she felt valueless because uh, it, if we talk further in the lie, the lie was that, hey, I'm a woman and that I need to produce a, a child for Andrew. And that's my, that's my role. That's my identity. That's what I should be doing. And then when... And so that's right. when that was be fruitful and multiply, right? <laughs> so that added this pressure to Rachel. This value. Now I have no value to Andrew and, and no value to God because I can't complete what I, I believe or what I thought God wanted me to do. Well, now what we began to journey through was this seeking of truth. What is the value that not only Rachel has, I would say the value that every single one of us in this room, because in the gospel, what is the value that we have? We were so worth it to God that he was willing to send his only son for us. 
And these are the things. So even as I'm talking this, I'm like, I know almost everybody in this room could quote what I'm saying. Like you, we all know these things. The hardest thing is to find that not only do we know these things, but do we believe these things? What does that produce in Rachel when, when she began to, to believe the lie that, hey, I wasn't valuable, I can't produce what I think that I'm supposed to produce, I, I have no value to Andrew, I have no value to God, I can't do these things. Well, then, man, I, and no matter what I said, like I, we said, the, the continual warfare in our house was no matter what I found value or how I tried to tell Rachel she was valuable or how I tried to prove her, her worth, she couldn't believe it. She was stuck on that line. Until God, in this moment, begin to go on a journey of us replacing those lies with the truth. The truth is, and this should be something we could like get up and shout about, the truth is Jesus himself came and took your place on the cross. You are so valuable to God that he sent his only son to you to die on the cross to go all the way point to the point of death to pay all of your penalties so that you could have eternal life with him, that you could live with him in unison. Now on the surface, sometimes we just, we just can quote that and we're like, okay, yeah, that's, a, that's something we know because we're Christian. No, if we truly believe that, we have infinite value. So what did that begin to produce in, in, in our relationship in, in Rachel? Now she, she knows her value. No, I truly believe, like, again, we're Bible college students, we're pastors, we're ministers, we're sharing the gospel. No, Rachel began to truly believe, no, my value is that the God of heaven, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, sent his only son on my behalf and paid all of my debt. I have infinite value to the King of kings, the Lord of lords. So now when we begin... Now when we begin to relate, right? Now it wasn't this constant trying to gain value from me and not me trying to give her value. No, I could just remind her now of the value she has in Christ. And so I would, I would, we, would we started doing this trend, uh, asking each other, hey Andrew, or hey Rachel, what are you believing right now? Because whatever you're believing isn't producing salvation. It isn't producing wholeness. But I can see cracks in the foundation for me. I know. You I had a pass when I wanted to. Go ahead. It's all right. Back up. We're, we're learning this. We're going to back up for a minute. So he was talking about like my value and how Jesus was showing me my value. Um, I just wanted to add a quick point of when we moved here four years ago, I had another episode of internal bleeding to the point where I had quit my daycare world job and start becoming a nanny because it was too stressful. But because of what Jesus had been teaching us through these years, I am able to now not get afraid when it happens. And I know that Jesus is going to be with me when it happens. And that I don't have to rely on anybody else but what Jesus is saying to me in these moments. And that was like a, a big deal to me. That um, I, after we got married, I had two more episodes after that, and they were completely different than what they were when I was as a child, or even in our early years of marriage. But because I allow Jesus to replace those lies with the truth, I'm able to trust Him in these times when sickness does happen. I just want to say because it was. It's a constant, it's a constant source of anxiety or fear. Before, when we believe lies, hey, I'm I'm alone. Nobody, God doesn't care about me. God, God doesn't it is a concern for me. And so, when we would face those difficult times uh, of the bleeding, and it's kind of normal trend. One minute to the next, one hour to the next. It would be the next. I wouldn't know. Yeah, it, it would be a constant source of worry. But now, knowing that the same God who raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. Now we, we know that whatever we face, whatever we're going through, now we can believe on that truth, that the same God that raised Christ from the dead. So when we think about that aspect of the gospel, uh, right? Jesus, the Messiah, the King, the Savior of the world, is coming, and especially even the Jewish people got caught up in lines, right? They were expecting Jesus to come and to, to set up his kingdom right away, right? Let, let's go overthrow the government. And, and that didn't happen. Jesus gets crucified. Jesus 
gets buried in a grave. Right? If any part of the story of God looks chaotic, looks out of control, looks hopeless, I mean, that's a spot of hopelessness. And when we were go through, I mean, talking to people over and over again, hey, can you help us out? Hey, what do you advise us? How do we get wholeness? I mean, we were hopeless to the point of thinking about losing life. And at that moment, God began to speak to us about, about the gospel, about the truth. That he raised Christ, that even death was not impossible for God. Even death couldn't hold back his plan. Even death didn't cause God, the Father in heaven, to lose control. And now all of a sudden, when we face things that seeming out of control, instead of like <laughs> yelling at each other, getting upset with each other because things haven't, worked out? No, now we can go in faith and say, no, God, I believe it because I know it's true about the gospel that you are still in control. And now instead of either trying to gain control from each other or trying to gain peace from each other, now we can have peace because we know the one that's in control and now we can relate to each other and meet each other's needs in a healthy way instead of trying to get control. I'm going to control you because because I don't because I know God's not in control. At least I believe God's not in control. I'm going to try to control you. No, now we know God is in control and now together we can walk through whatever God, whatever life faces us. So if you're experiencing our, 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 our word today, if you're experiencing chaos, anxiety, depression, symptoms of brokenness in your life or your relationship, I want to encourage you that it's not, a, it's not a symptom just of a broken relationship. It's actually a symptom of unbelief in your heart. The broken relationships or the broken things in your life are just a byproduct of unbelief in your heart. Because when we truly believe who God is, we do, like Jesus said, experience freedom. I'm no longer, I'm no longer trying to please, please Rachel completely. I still, you know, like to dress nicer. All right, so I, 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 I'm not trying to, to to please Rachel and get Rachel's approval or get my. Um, get my satisfaction by what I can do for her because I know that, that I cannot do anything I now believe. I cannot do anything more perfect or, or better than Christ that he has done the perfect way. So now I can rest in the fact that Christ has completed it all. Christ has done it all for her. I'm not the one that ha has to do it for her. Christ has done it for her. Now I believe on that. And so now I can rest in it. I'm not trying... All right, all right, and now I, I'm, not, I'm not always trying and working harder to prove the love or to prove her value. No, I know she has value, and she has, knows she has value because of Christ. Now I can rest in it, and now I've become a more rested person, not relying on my own abilities or my own tasks to bring value to somebody, but to rely on his work, because he's done it way better than I can. Our hope is, is not in finding a perfect man. It's not in finding a perfect woman. Our, our hope is not in better communication skills. Oh, that did help. Especially if you're complete opposites on everything. We, we uh, in, in about year six, right before God began to do this work in our life, we went to a counselor and they, they did a um, compatibility test. They said, all right, let's find areas of common interest in your lives. <laughs> there was hundreds of questions. There was 30 plus that. categories. They sat us down after we took the test. They brought us back in. They said, well, we can see why you guys have been having some issues. <laughs> they said, there's only one category that you guys relate with each other on. And I said, the only thing that is relatable is your beliefs on Jesus. Everything else, and who you are and how you're made up, uh, are opposite. And so they did begin to teach us some communication skills. But we, so again, like we said, we need Jesus and some wise counsel is good, is good for you uh, to learn some communication skills. But our hope was not in communication skills. Your hope is not in better skills that you can gain. Though, yeah, they, they'll be helpful, they can help you a long way. But it's in your, your belief fully on God in which you can have hope for restoration, for wholeness, for whole relationships. You must, we must, abide in Jesus to satisfy our innermost being so that then we can relate to one another not out of grabbing 
out of trying to control, out of trying to get what we need, but out of satisfaction in Jesus so that then next week we'll see that marriage is meant to be a relationship that is full of love. Submitting to one another, thinking about the, bad, the, the other's best interest at your greatest expense. And when you're doing so in a way that you're satisfied in Jesus, then your relationship is able to look like peace and wholeness. I just wanted to add that just because in our story the oppression left immediately after we realized this, doesn't always happen that way. It might take a day, it might take two days, it might take a week, it might take a month. Who knows how long it's going to take. But just because the Lord took the oppression immediately doesn't mean that if it doesn't happen for you right away, that it's not going to happen. It just means that there's more stuff in your heart that the Lord is wanting to deal with before it's completely gone. It's gonna take time. But Andrew and I are here to walk with you through it. Because you're worth it. You are valued. You are loved. You are chosen. Because the Lord God Almighty created each and every single one of you. He knew your name before your mama did. And that's what's amazing. So we we want to take a time to pray. Like Rachel, uh, you know, that moment was an accumulation of two and a half years. So that was probably two and a half years after us being at Purdue. Yeah. Uh, Linda praying with us, us starting to go to counseling, us starting to seek after some healing and some truth. Where then all of a sudden, God brought the opportunity to me. Andrew, do you trust me? And to Rachel, hey, here's some truth that you've been neglecting to believe. And then we saw it from that moment forward, us be able to begin a, a true, full experience of God's healing. And so this morning, the opportunity for us, again, is if we are, if you are in need of hope. So, you know, maybe we didn't tell every detail of every story. We said, oh, we're not going to tell the time where I threw a burrito across the room and broke, <laughs> and broke the oven and like, you know, all of those, all of those in-depth stories of chaos. Um, but we wanted to, to tell. I laughed. It was so bad. Um, I thought it was ice. Oh, it was, it was a bad day. It was a bad day. But we didn't tell every detail of the story because we know that, hey, as we as we speak to these things today, it brings up real stories and real things in your minds of things that you have gone through or the things that you're experiencing. Our biggest uh, point that we wanted to make is that if you need hope, if you need restoration, if you need redemption, Christ has it for you. We're not ashamed of the gospel because we know that it is the power for salvation for all those who believe. And so this morning, before we go, I want to take that opportunity, and we do want to pray with you. If you're saying, hey, Andrew, I, I, I need some hope. I, I, got the, I got a mess. I got a situation. Um, and Rachel and I say, you know what? We want to be pastors that are for you. You know, we don't have, we, we'll say like Linda, we don't have all the answers yet, uh, but we're willing to go with you. We're, we're willing to travel with you because we know that there's hope in the gospel. We've experienced the gospel power in our lives. And we know that it's there for you. We believe it full heartedly. And so we want to walk with you. We want to pray with you. We want to get the help, whatever help, if there's extra help needed, we want to get it for you. Because we know that God desires us to be whole, to be restored. So why don't we stand this morning? And I, and I ask you to stand just because um, that may help motivate us to move if we need to move. All right? Uh, and I want to I'm gonna pray over uh, us in this moment. And then I want to invite you, if you need hope this morning, uh, one of the biggest things when I was going through my struggle is what would people think? If I responded to that altar call, what would people think about me? This morning, I want to encourage you, this is a no shame kind of place. I don't want there to be any shaming. I don't want there to be any condemnation. If you need Jesus and you want hope, I want to encourage you to come forward to the altar and to receive from God. And we're going to begin or continue on this journey to receive truth over the lives that we believe. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your redemption and your restoration. 
Uh, Father, it is full of joy, it is full of hope, it is full of promise, and I thank you for what you've done in Rachel in my life and in our marriage. And God, I pray now for every individual, every couple, every family represented here today, God, that if they are in need of hope, if they are in need of you, I pray that they would respond full-heartedly, and God, that they would receive from you truth, victory, wholeness, Father, to walk out what you have designed for them, what you desire for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.